chapter 2, as we start this, is just going to pick up from where we left off with chapter 1. The beauty about accounting, truly, is that once you get certain concepts, as you move on to intermediate or to accounting or managerial, they're the same concepts. They just become a little more complicated, but it's the same concept. Um, so basically, we're going to continue talking about these financial statements, which again, income statement, statement of retained earnings, the balance sheet, and then there's the statement of cash flows we're really not talking about. But we were aware of what we're talking, you know, the statement of cash flows. So let's look um, at a little more. Let's delve into these financial statements greater. The balance sheet. Remember we talk about a balance sheet being a snapshot in time. It's a, a point of time. Think of it like taking a picture. A balance sheet is a picture as of one moment. Because the minute you walk away from that snapshot and you bring in more money or you pay more bills, that balance sheet is going to change. So it's not an accumulation like a, an income statement is, an accumulation of all the revenues you've made over the past month and an accumulation of the expenses. A balance sheet's just a picture right now. So we normally take these pictures or snapshots at the end of each period, at the end of December, or at the end of a quarter, at the end of June. And we basically try to encourage that everyone has similar guidelines in creating, in creating financial statements and balance sheets. So we can compare Target to Walmart, or we can compare Microsoft to Dell to you know, some Apple to similar companies. And not to get you too confused, but there are guidelines out there called generally accepted accounting principles that make us adhere to certain standards of how we do financial statements. So basically, when we're dealing with a balance sheet, we're required to break apart a balance sheet in certain categories. We show assets, and then we also show our stockholders' equity and our liabilities on the other side or below. And we specify or we separate out our assets based on certain categories. So as you can see here, we have a current assets. Then we've got long-term investments. And then we have another category called property, plant, and equipment. And then last, intangible assets. So that's how when we create our balance sheet, we don't just show our buildings and then cash and then stock in a company. We have it very specified that we start with our most liquid assets first, or our current assets first, and then we move on to those items that are harder to liquidate. So for example, cash is as liquid as it gets. Investments are pretty easy to liquidate, you just have to sell them. You know, stock on the trading. But a building like this building, how many people are able to buy something like this? It's harder to liquidate, isn't it? It's going to be easier to liquidate a computer than it is going to be to liquidate a building, a heavy fixed asset. And then intangible assets such as goodwill, trademarks, they're very hard to liquidate, in, you know, unless someone wants to buy a patent. But even that, very few people are in the market to purchase someone's patent. So you can see that these categories start from things that are most liquid to those that are harder to liquidate. And then over on the section of liabilities, you're going to start with those current liabilities that are due within the current period. And then the long-term liabilities are those liabilities that are going to take more than just one year to pay off. So current liabilities might be paying the utility bill, paying um, various um, suppliers. But long-term liabilities might be notes at the bank that are over 10 years or mortgages that are 30 years. Does that make sense? And then after our liabilities, we put our stockholders equity. So we don't place the stockholders equity above the liabilities. We put them below. This is just the standard way everybody has to do financial statements. So if you go and look at companies, they all provide them this manner, in this manner. 
Okay, here's an example of a balance sheet. You can see here they're up and down. It's not side by side, but um, the assets, we start with our current assets. We've got cash, as liquid as they come, and then various investments. Our debt investments are basically investments that we can just go and sell and convert to cash right away. We've got our accounts receivable. Now this is the money due us from um, customers. That's going to come in pretty soon. We hope that most of that's going to come in within the next 30 days. Then we've got something called notes receivable. This is the portion that we're going to receive in this current um, operating cycle. Inventory is considered a current asset. Now people have all kinds of inventory, but generally speaking, when you have inventory, the goal of businesses is to move that inventory quickly. Okay? You don't buy something and plan to have it on your shelves for 30 years, or for two years at that matter. You know, that's something you'll learn in managerial accounting, but the turnover rate for like Dell, I think is every six days. You know, they turn over their entire inventory rapidly, which is efficient because they're not wasting money on interest and storage. Make sense? But then when we're dealing with car lots, don't you think their inventory might last a little longer just because of the mere nature of what the product is? But still, when they bring in those cars, they're hoping to sell them within 30 to 60 to 90 days, right? Jewelry stores are a little tougher, okay? The items are bigger, they're more unique and specific. It might take them six months to sell an item. But the goal is to make that inventory not so heavy on the books where it costs money to have all those dollars in place. So know that it's a current asset. Then after that, we've got supplies sitting that we haven't used yet. And then something called prepaid insurance is when we pay our insurance for, say, a whole year at a time, but we're going to show that insurance as an expense when that period of time passes. So we've paid insurance up front for a certain amount of time, and we keep it on our books as a current asset until we use it up. So those of you that maybe pay your insurance for your automobile one, um, once a year, get what I'm saying? You might pay it up front a thousand bucks once a year. You'd show it as a prepaid insurance and then when January's done, you take um, one twelfth of that amount, take it away from prepaid insurance and show it as an insurance expense. Think of those, um, uh, the companies that have sales, um, sales individuals that own cars, okay? All those expenses, they might pay up front, but they write it off as the time passes. Um, so those are all of our current assets. Then we move on to things that are a little less liquid, but still pretty liquid, stock, investments, and investments in real estate. So these items are things that there was money free and they decided to utilize that money to make some um, earnings. But it's fairly easy to turn around and just sell some stock. It's pretty available for trading. Um, investment in real estate, depending on what type, the money's sitting in an asset and, and hopefully the plan is to sell it. If you need it, it's gonna be a little harder to sell than just having cash available, but it's a little more liquid than would it be in a patent or intangible asset. So that's the next step. Then we've got this property, plant, and equipment. Land, equipment. So think of Augsburg. You know, this, this uh, granted, Augsburg has been around for a while, but could you even imagine what this property is valued at today? I don't know. But you, I can imagine on their books, the land is never something called depreciated. The land they probably purchased 80 years ago for who knows how much, 200000 It's And that's what the books would show because that's what they bought it for. My guess is this land is worth many million dollars, Do you know, because it's in the heart of downtown. The buildings or the equipment, all of those items are going to be hard to sell. Who can come in apart from the U of M and just buy out this building? Not many people have that, those means. So this is a lot less liquid. And then finally, our intangible assets are our final category. 
and then we take all of these categories and we total them all together for total assets. So basically, again, we started with chapter one talking about assets. All we're doing in this chapter is breaking them down a little more so you understand where they go and fit in the balance sheet. Okay? Any questions? Now, we'll move to liabilities and stockholders' equity. Same kind of deal here. We start with those liabilities that are, need to be paid with money sooner than later. So our current liabilities, notes that are due within the period, accounts payable. Now, remember me talking about that unearned revenue. Here's some unearned sales revenue where somehow money was collected, but they really haven't earned the money yet. They haven't sold the goods. So they show that as a liability because they're planning on selling them, getting that money, and showing it as earned very soon. Salary and wages payable. Probably what happened, the salary could have, the week might have ended, or the pay period might have ended October 30th or October 31st, but a lot of times companies don't pay the, the salary for another week, okay? So that salary has already been an expense, but they need to pay out the employees. So you know that's going to happen in this period. And then interest payable, maybe they have um, interest on credit cards or interest at banks they need to pay. So the current ones, those items that are going to be due um, in the current period are shown as current liabilities. And then these long-term liabilities are those that are going to last over a year. Mortgages and notes are long-term liabilities. That total balance is not going to be due within the current period. It's going to be due way far out. Then you've got your stockholders' equity section, and for the most part, we're focusing on our common stock and our retained earnings. So all of these subcategories, again, are going to total the total stock total liabilities and stockholders equity here of 61.4. And just like you see here the assets for 61.4, our liabilities are also 61.4. So current assets, assets a company expects to convert to cash or use up within a year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer. For our purposes here, guys, in this classroom, we're going to assume an operating cycle and a year are synonymous. They're the same thing. There are times when an operating cycle may last longer than a year, but very, very seldom, not for our purposes. There may be companies that, because of the types of projects they deal with, their operating cycle may continue on for 18 months. But for our purposes, we're going to say a year, OK? An operating cycle is the average time it takes from the purchase of inventory to the collection of cash from customers. Common types of current assets, cash, investments, receivables, inventory, and prepaid expenses. So if you saw a question on a quiz that said, what type of asset is a prepaid expense? Your answer would be current asset, okay? Inventory is a current asset. Cash is absolutely a current asset. Um, and most receivables are going to be current assets. You're going to get that money in the current operating cycle. Now, um, current assets are listed from the most current to the ones that are a little harder to convert into cash. So cash is always going to be the first. Then, you're, as you're going to see, short-term investments, receivables, inventory, prepaid expenses. You're going to list them in that order. The key here is not to pick, you know, pick it apart and say you listed them wrong. The key here is in the order they expect to be converted into cash. The most liquid happened first. OK, so here we have a question. Cash and other resources that are reasonably expected to be realized in cash are sold or consumed in the business within one year of the operating cycle are called? Yes, current assets. Then we've got our long-term investments, or we can just call them investments. Investments that um, we plan to hold for more than a year. 
These are going to be stocks and bonds of other companies, not our company. That's a different deal. When we go and buy back our own stock, that's called treasury stock. Totally different deal that's put on the stockholders equity section. But this scenario is, let's say we um, have some money free and we want to, um, in, instead of letting it sit at 1%, we're going to go buy target stock for a year. Then those would be considered investments. So investments come next, then our long-term assets are going to come next. Long-term assets such as land or buildings that a company is not currently using in its operating activities. So basically, when we're dealing with long-term investments, our property, plant, and equipment is on a separate fixed assets of property, plant, and equipment. These are assets that, let's say Augsburg owns um, 20 acres down in Rosemount, with the hopes of maybe one day starting some horticulture. So it has a long-term investment down in Rosemount, but it's not doing anything with that land right now. That would be an investment, okay? Um, it's not this land because they are doing something with this land. We're sitting here, okay? Make sense? And then long-term notes receivable. Let's say they um, had the means of um, they had some, well, how do I, they had money available and they ended up lending someone um, 500000 because they were going to get some decent interest and they thought it was a secure investment. A note receivable is something that they're anticipating receiving along with interest. See what I'm saying? Um, a long-term note receivable that they are going to receive, not a payable, but they're going to receive, would be under this total investments here. Then we've got property, plant, and equipment. Now these are those assets like this building that are being used for the operating of the business. It's not something that they might plan on expanding. They don't know what they're going to do. This is what they're really using to run the business. They're used in operations and they include the security trucks you see out here, the buildings, all the desks, the tables, the chairs, the computers, the technology. Um, all of that's included. Now there is something we're going to talk about down the road but I'm just going to mention it. Depreciation is the way in which we take these items that are so expensive and big and going to last us for a period of time and we take a piece of it and we expense a little bit of the building each year. This is called depreciation. So say for example, this computer. This computer should last two years or three years. So there is wear and tear and maybe not even just wear and tear but technology is going to change. So just based on the use or based on um, it becoming um, inadequate or depleted because just of the mere technology, instead of writing all this off, this one computer when we buy it, we're going to take that computer and depreciate it over the number of years of its useful life. So that way we're offsetting any expenses with the money we're making. So this building, this building can last 30 years, 50 years. So instead of when they build a building or that Oren Center, instead of taking that 30 million and writing it all off in one year, they take that 30 million and, and take the use on that building over 50 years. So we're offsetting that expense as we're using it up, okay? The wear and tear of the building. Um, and then the depreciation that we get to write off, we have something that, that offsets that depreciation called accumulated depreciation that just allows us to see how much depreciation we've taken on buildings, okay? Well, I don't want to say too much about it, but know that there is that concept that we'll look into more. So as you see here, a portion of the balance sheet with property, plant, and equipment it shows the various property, plant, land, buildings, machineries, um, um, pieces of the machinery, 
shows 2,244,508. Then it shows the amount of depreciation that's been accumulated over the life of these assets that have been depreciated of 1,252,691. To show a basis, or what's called an adjusted basis, in all of our property, plant, and equipment of 991. Now, it's important to note these numbers here aren't what they're worth today. It's what you bought them for, okay? So Augsburg, this building on their books might be at 30,000. Now, we know they maybe could sell it for 20 million, but the, the price on Augsburg's books is what they bought it for, less the depreciation that's been taken plus improvements in the building, don't get me wrong, but it's not what the value is of the building. That's a really important item to note because a lot of times people think that they should be able to take the fair market value of a building. You can't do that. It's what they bought it for. Okay, and then we've got these intangible assets. Intangible assets are those things that really have a value, but you can't see it. So we all know I mean, the best type of patent I'm familiar with, um, anybody who's familiar with drugs, you know, antidepressants, or Viagra's the big one, huh? Didn't that, who would have thought Viagra made such a hit? You guys are too young to appreciate it. But anyway, I have a father who's 88. I won't get into some of the stories. But needless to say, my stepmother tells me a little more than I want to know. And the Viagra made my dad's heart go pounding. They were scared of him getting the heart attack. So... Needless to say, that piece of their life has, um, anyway, moving on, patents are huge though, you know, like um, certain antidepressants, um, a, month long, a month prescription used to cost me like 300 bucks, you know, when it was um, patented. Now that the patent's released, it's like 10 bucks. Do you get what I'm saying? Um, and so even though you can't see it, Patents have a great deal of value. Can anyone else think of a patent or trademark or an intangible? Anybody? What if we wanted to go buy the, I don't wanna talk about the Vikings, but let's say we wanted to go buy, oh, hey, how about that guy who's getting in trouble right now? Any, Oprah wants to buy it? Uh, Sterling. Sterling? I mean, why can't Oprah just buy it for like, you know, a buck? Well, there's, there's worth in just the name of a franchise. Actually, I think his franchise is losing value just because of what he, it's represented. But sometimes, Green Bay Packers is an example, although it's not for sale, you know, the people own it. but. Certain franchises just have a name just because there's value in that name. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Um, there are franchises such as, let's say I'm going to start Nancy's Pizza. Well, why can't I just use the name Devani's Pizza? Why the heck do they care? Look, my pizza's going to be just as good as theirs. Why does it matter? Because what? It's a differentiation. And with the Devani's Pizza comes a certain um, value that people expect. Or Pizza Hut or Carboni's. Do you see? So people sometimes want to get into those franchises. There's value in just being able to work under a certain name. McDonald's. My gosh, just think of the dollar value because it's a McDonald's. I could have Nancy's hamburgers, but it's not going to make out like McDonald's is going to do, isn't it? There's worth in just having that name and what's behind that name. So intangible assets, customer lists, um, trademarks, all of those things make up the last category. Make sense? Anyone, can anyone think of various types of patents? Yes. Uh, like the iPhone patents. Oh, huge. Yeah. And hasn't... Hasn't Microsoft gotten in trouble? Yeah, they got sued. They've gotten sued, and they and Apple won because they tried to copy certain aspects of the iPhone. I'm not an Apple fan. You know, my kids have just like 
everything's Apple. And I got an iPad two years ago, two years, maybe two years and one month ago. I'm hooked. Got my Apple iPad, love it. And so then I got my iPhone. I'm so hooked. It syncs. I can talk to all my kids on um, whatever it is. It's easy to use. I had that Galaxy phone for five years and I never knew how to text or leave messages or anything. You know, get what I'm saying? There was some ease in it. And um, somehow they were, they got their hands slapped, so they must have done something wrong because Apple was able to patent their product and have certain aspects of it other people couldn't utilize. Good, good one. So I've become an Apple fan. And I would have an Apple computer except I, my tax software needs to be, um, what do you call it? PC. PC compatible. And I know Apple has the ability to switch it back and forth, but it slows down the operating systems too. Anybody else could think of something? What would airspace be considered? Like people buy the rights to airspace and like they never use it. Like give me an example of what you mean, airspace. Like someone has a building, they bought the space above them, so they no one can build around them. Well, the airspace, the airports, they have certain air rights. You know, you're bringing up a point. I know, like a house. Say I live in a house. I think we're only uh, we only truly have that space just you know within 300 feet above our house. Do you know what I'm saying? But airspace, as it relates to airports and the ability to taxi, I don't understand any of that. I would think that's more of a legislative type of um, issue. I have a client who is a patent attorney, excuse me, he, he mainly does eminent domain. And so those of you that are familiar with all these electrical lines going through our state, there's one on 52 going um, the eastern part, and I guess something happened going out to South Dakota. But he's had to go, and eminent domain is basically for the public good. People have to sell their land back to the state, you know, or to, for a purpose. And so in that case, I mean, obviously, they're in a position to have their wires. You know, that's all, that's a whole different language than I'm familiar with. But we can't ju necessarily just go out on my property and erect something a thousand feet high. You know, I legally am not allowed to do that. So there's more legislative and legal issues regarding that. But any questions on this? Yes. What exactly is goodwill as an intangible asset? Okay. Goodwill, okay, here's an example. I have a client who um, they are engineers and they create these types of products that test um, various types of chemicals. So the first one they did back in the 90s was anthrax, before we all knew what anthrax was. So they created these boxes, and in that case, they didn't patent, well, they did patent it, but it was they sold it to the Army, which really doesn't matter, because the Army, you don't need to patent things with the Army. But then from that, they've taken, and they can identify the particles in fluids. You know, it's these I don't know what you call it, volumetric types of analysis. And so they will create these patents and sell these products. Other stuff they do is solar arms on the, the trains. You know, when a train's coming and there's, they use some solar types of energy for the arms the hydraulics to move. So they sell these and then let's say another company wants to buy that product. Okay, so there's goodwill associated with just the um, the positive vibe of those products. Let's just even say the patents are done. It, because they want to um, sell an aspect, there's worth in this company beyond just the product. Let me give you an example of goodwill. Let's say I have a business. I've had it for 30 years, and I want to sell it. Well, you, we can take my tables, and we can take my computers, and let's say it amounts to 10000 But I want to sell it for $100,000. they are going to go, no, I only see assets in here of ten. 
I'm gonna go, no, but I've been going on for 30 years and there's a name associated with my practice. Do you understand what I'm trying to get at? And so that's that goodwill, that's that intangible piece someone's willing to pay for because of that goodwill. Um, let me think of another example. Um, how many of you guys, well you guys are guys so you probably aren't, but like how much of certain jeans or certain clothing or certain items, is it really that great a quality or are you willing to spend that extra money because it's Nike or armor, under armor? But let's just say they are equal. Let's say the Target brand champion is equal, or it might not even be champion. What's it called, the Target brand? Champion. Champion. Is equal to armor, Under Armour. In price or just in? In quality. Okay. But why would you buy the Under Armour? The name. The name. It's just a name. But somehow we have value in that name, don't we? Do you understand what I'm trying to get at? Why do we do that? Why? I have these sunglasses. They're Ray-Bans. Actually, I'm not a good example of that because I could care less. But, um, you know, sometimes people are willing to spend a little more on something because of the name. I got a perfect example. I have this nice purse. I didn't buy it though. And y'all probably don't know about purses. Women know about purses. So about three years ago, my sisters came up to uh, Minnesota and they all have these nice Louis Vuitton purses. And I looked at them one day and I said, wow, like what kind of, what does that per cost? Or, you know, and then they told me, it's like, oh, forget that. The next week I had one in the mail to me. Now the truth is guys, it's a piece of shit. The zipper has already broken on me. A dog started chewing it. I mean, but why is someone willing to spend 2,000 bucks for a piece of a purse when I can go to TJ Maxx and get a great one for under 100 bucks? Why? Why would you spend 2,000 bucks on a damn purse? I could have had two computers by that. And I still can't even zip it now. Look, I can't even zip it. Why? Goodwill. You know, it's that intrinsic value you can't explain. Do you get what I'm saying, kind of? A little? Wedding day jeweler. Don't they try to make it like their jewelry's the best because they have this new diamond? Yumi and what are, what's the other guy's name? Dean? Anyway, goodwill is something that gets created and people are willing to pay the money for it. I'm probably getting off on a tangent, sorry. I'll back off on this one. So anyway, all these intangible assets go next. Now you cannot, this is important to know, the only way you can show those intangible assets on a company's books is because you buy that intangible asset. It can't happen just because I want to say, oh, this is worth it because I've put this money into it. You have to actually go out and buy that intangible asset to be able to have it on your books. So a trademark name, you have to put that money into it, attorney fees, whatever, or buy it from someone. Review question. Patents and copyrights are A, current assets, B, intangible assets, C, long-term investments, or D, property, plant, and equipment? Tangible. So then we've got these current liabilities. These are monies or obligations, uh, amounts due, that the company is to pay within the next year. Examples, accounts payable, salaries, notes, interest, income taxes, everything due within the year. Also included as current liabilities are the current maturities of long-term obligations. So what that means, in a nutshell, I own a house and I have a mortgage, and you don't want to know how bad my mortgage is, but let's say I have um, 15 more years on my mortgage, okay? So this, say, 300000 I owe on my house is over 15 years. 
But the amount that I really owe this year on that 300000 okay, the interest in the principal of, say, 1800 a month over the next 12 months, that amount, because I have to pay it now, is a current liability. Even though the mortgage is a long-term mortgage, it's a long-term, the amount I owe in this current operating cycle for that long-term is a current liability. Am I confusing you guys when I say that? So let's say out of that $300,000, i am going to pay off, you know, 6000 of that this year. You get what I'm saying? That 6000 along with the interest, would be a current liability. But that big mortgage that's going to last for 15 years is still a long-term liability. Am I confusing you guys? Make sense? Do you reduce the long-term by a year? Yes. Okay. Yes, you do. Okay. So here you see current liabilities, notes, accounts payable, current maturities on long-term debt. This is long-term debt out there, but what's due in this current period, income taxes and salaries. Then we finally have our long-term liabilities. These are the amounts we owe that are going to be paid after this year, way past this year. Bonds, sometimes companies um, offer issue bonds, and they might not have to pay them back for 30 years, okay? So that's going to be a long-term payable. Mortgages, leases, if there's a lease out there for 20 years, that's going to sit on their books a while. Pensions are another thing. People who work at companies that have pensions, those pensions are going to be um, accruing for years and years. You know, you, you're an employee today, well, they're going to owe you money and a lot of money down the road. So those are long-term liabilities. They're not going to have to pay them out this year, but they'll be paying them out. Make sense, guys, what I'm talking about? Okay, which of the following is not a long-term liability? A, bonds payable. B, current maturities on long-term debt. C, long-term notes payable. Or D, mortgages payable. Current maturities on long-term debt. And guys, I promise you, you'll see that one again. Okay? Because it's kind of tricky, but it really does make sense. But the current amount due on long-term debt is a current liability. And then finally, we have this stockholders' equity section that includes the investment, of the common stock, that stock that was issued, bless you, um, for the company, and then retained earnings. All the money that's come in throughout all the years, minus the dividends that have been paid out, that accumulated retained earnings is part of the stockholders' equity section. Okay? I think I'm going to take a break here. So